This video is a continuation of the last episode number 12. Think about all the attempts you've made, the endless speeches, the pleading, threats, bribes, maybe even violence, all the avenues you've tried that haven't worked. And remember how you felt after each failed attempt. Your self-esteem slipped another notch, and you became more anxious, more helpless, more angry. The only way out of all this is to let go of the attempt to control what you cannot him and his life. Finally, it is necessary to stop because he will almost never change in the face of pressure from you. What should be his problem begins to look like your problem, and somehow you end up stuck with it unless you let go. Even if he does attempt to placate you with some promise of changing his ways, he will probably revert back to his old behavior, often with much resentment toward you when he does so. Remember, if you are the reason he gives up a behavior, you'll also be the reason he resumes it. Example, two young people are in my office. Referred by his probation officer because of alcohol or drug offenses, he is there because he's in trouble with the law. She's there because she tries to go everywhere with him. She sees it as her job to keep him on the straight and narrow. As is so common in such cases, both of them come from homes where there is alcoholism in at least one parent. As they sit before me, holding hands, they tell me they are going to get married. I think getting married will help him, the young woman says, sometimes with shy compassion, sometimes with firm determination. Yeah, he nods sheepishly. She keeps me from getting too wild. She helps me a lot. There is a note of relief in his voice, and his girlfriend glows with pleasure at the faith he has in her, at the responsibility for his life that she has been given. And I try, gently, in the face of their hope and their love, to explain that if he has a problem with alcohol or other drugs and she is the reason he slows down or stops drinking or using drugs now, she will also be the reason he speeds up or starts drinking and using drugs all over again later. I warn them both that someday he will say to her, in the middle of an argument, I quit for you and what difference has it made? You're never happy, so why should I keep trying? Soon they will be torn apart by the very forces that seem now to bring them together. What the implications are when you stop managing and controlling him he may become very angry and accuse you of not caring about him anymore. This anger generates from his panic at having to become responsible for his own life. As long as he can fight with you, make you promises, or try to win you back, his struggle is outside, with you, and not inside with himself. Sound familiar? It's true for you, too, as long as your struggle is with him. You may find there is very little to talk about once all the cajoling, arguing, threatening, fighting, and making up stops. It's okay. Say your affirmations quietly to yourself in the silence. It is very likely that, once you truly let go of managing and controlling him, a great deal of your energy will be freed up that you can then use for exploring, developing, and enhancing yourself. It is important to know, however, that the temptation will be there to again look outside yourself for a raison d'etre. Curb this inclination and stay focused on yourself. It is only fair to mention that as you let go of the role of smoothing out his life, things may get chaotic, and you may receive some criticism from people who don't understand what you are doing, or not doing. Try not to be defensive, and don't bother going into detailed explanations for them. If you like, recommend they read this book, and then drop the subject. If they persist, avoid them for a while. Usually, such criticism is far less frequent and far less intense than we both expect and fear. We are our own worst critics, and we project our expectation of criticism out onto those around us, seeing it and hearing it everywhere. Be on your own side in all this, and the world will magically become a more approving place. One of the implications of letting go of managing and controlling others is that you must relinquish the identity of being helpful, but ironically, that very act of letting go is frequently the single most helpful thing you can do for the one you love. The identity of being helpful is an ego trip. If you really want to be helpful, let go of his problems and help yourself. Point six. Learn to not get hooked into the games. What it means the concept of games as they apply to dialogue between two people comes from the type of psychotherapy known as transactional analysis. Games are structured ways of interacting that are employed to avoid intimacy. Everybody resorts to games in their interactions sometimes, but in unhealthy relationships, the games abound. They are stereotyped ways of responding that serve to circumvent any genuine exchange of information and feelings, and allow the participants to put the responsibility for their well-being or distress in each other's hands. Typically, the roles played by women who love too much and their partners are varieties of the rescuer, persecutor, and victim positions. 
Each of the pair plays each of these roles many times in a typical exchange. We will designate the role of rescuer as R, define it as trying to help, the role of persecutor as P, and define it as trying to blame, and the role of victim as V, defined as the one who is blameless and helpless. The following script will illustrate how this game works. Tom, who often comes home late, has just arrived in his bedroom. It is 11.30 p.m. and his wife, Mary, begins. Mary, tearfully, V, where were you? I've been so worried. I couldn't sleep, I was so afraid there'd been an accident. You know how I worry. How could you let me lie here like this and not at least call to let me know you were still alive? Tom, placating, R, O, honey, I'm sorry. I thought you'd be asleep and I didn't want to wake you up by calling. Don't be upset. I'm home now and I'll call next time, I promise. As soon as I get ready for bed I'll rub your back and you'll feel better. Mary, getting angry, P, I don't want you to touch me. You say you'll call next time. That's a joke. You told me the last time this happened that you'd call, and did you? No. You don't care if I lie here thinking of you dead out on the highway. You never think of anybody else, so you don't know how it feels to worry about somebody you love. Tom, helplessly, V, honey, that's not true. I was thinking of you. I didn't want to wake you. I didn't know you'd be upset. I was just trying to be thoughtful. Seems like no matter what I try, I'm wrong. What if I'd called you and you were asleep? Then I'd be a jerk for waking you up. I can't win. Mary, relenting, R, now, that's not true. It's just that you're so important to me, I want to know that you're all right, not run over somewhere. I'm not trying to make you feel bad, I just want you to understand that I worry about you because I love you so much. I'm sorry I got so mad. Tom, sensing an edge, P, well, if you worry so much, why aren't you glad to see me when I get home? How come you hit me with all this whining about where I was? Don't you trust me? I'm getting tired of having to explain everything to you all the time. If you trusted me you'd go to sleep, and when I got home you'd be glad to see me instead of jumping all over me. Sometimes I think you just like to fight. Mary, voice rising, P, glad to see you. After lying here for two hours wondering where you were? If I don't trust you it's because you never do anything to help me build that trust. You don't call, you blame me for being upset, and then accuse me of not being nice to you when you finally drag in the door. Why don't you just turn around and go back wherever you came from, wherever you've been all evening? Tom, soothing, R, look, I know you're upset, and I've got a big day tomorrow. How about if I make you a cup of tea? That's what you need. Then I'll take a shower and come to bed. Okay? Mary, crying, V, you just don't understand how it feels to be waiting and waiting, knowing that you could call but don't, because I'm not that important to you. Shall we stop here? As you can probably see, these two could go on trading places on their triangle of positions as rescuer, persecutor, and victim for many more hours or days, even years. If you find yourself responding to any statement or action of another person from any of these positions, beware. You are participating in a no-win cycle of accusation, rebuttal, blame, and counter-blame that is pointless, futile, and degrading. Stop. Let go of trying to make it turn out the way you want it to by being nice, being angry, or being helpless. Change what you can, which means change yourself. Stop needing to win. Stop even needing to fight, or to make him give you a good reason or excuse for his behavior or neglect. Stop needing him to be sufficiently sorry. What not getting hooked into the games requires not getting hooked requires that even though you are tempted to respond in any one of the ways you know will keep the game going, you don't. You respond in a way that will end the game. It's a little tricky at first, but with practice you'll easily master it, if you also master your need to play the games in the first place, which is part of the previous step, letting go of managing and controlling. Let's look again at the situation above and see how Mary could stay off that deadly triangle with Tom. By now, Mary has started developing her spirituality, and she is aware that she has no business trying to manage and control Tom. Because she is working on taking care of herself, earlier this evening, when it began to get late and Tom hadn't come home, instead of allowing herself to get nervous and worked up about it, she called a friend in her support group. They talked about her mounting fear, which helped to calm her. Mary needed someone to hear how she felt, and her friend listened with understanding but without giving advice. After she hung up, she practiced one of her favorite affirmations, my life is divinely guided, and I grow in peace, security, and serenity every day, every hour. 
Since no one can hold two separate thoughts at once, Mary found that as she gave her thoughts over to the soothing words of the affirmation, she became calm and even relaxed. By the time Tom got home at 11, 30, she was asleep. He woke her when he came into the room, and she immediately felt the annoyance and anger returning, so she repeated her affirmation to herself a couple of times and said, Hi, Tom. I'm glad you're home. Now, Tom has always been used to a battle under these circumstances, and was a little nonplussed at her casual greeting. I was going to call you, but, he begins his excuse defensively. Mary waits till he's finished and says, We can talk about it in the morning if you like. I'm too sleepy now. Good night. If Tom was feeling guilty about the lateness of the hour, a fight with Mary would actually have eased his guilt. He could then tell himself that she was a nagging shrew and the problem would become hers, for nagging, instead of his, for being late. As it is, he's left with his guilt, and she's not suffering because of his actions. That's the way it should be. It's kind of like a game of ping pong, when you're both doing the rescuer persecutor victim thing. You keep hitting the ball back, when it comes your way. In order not to get hooked into playing, you have to learn to let the ball go right past you, off the end of the table. One of the greatest ways of letting it go is to cultivate the use of the word oh. For instance, in response to Tom's excuse, Mary can just respond, oh, and go back to sleep. It is an empowering experience not to get caught up in the struggle implicit in the rescuer-persecutor-victim kind of exchange. To not get hooked, to maintain your centeredness, your dignity, feels wonderful. And it means you've taken another step in your own recovery. Why not getting hooked into the games is necessary to begin with, understand that the game roles we play are not confined to mere verbal exchanges. They extend to the way we play out our lives, and each of us has a particular role that we may especially favor. Perhaps yours is the role of rescuer. It is familiar and comforting to many women who love too much to feel that they are taking care of, managing and controlling, another person. Out of their chaotic and or deprived history, they have chosen this path as a way of staying safe and earning some degree of self-acceptance. They do it with friends, family members, and often in their careers as well. Or perhaps you find yourself playing the persecutor, the woman who is intent on finding the fault, pointing it out, and setting things right. Again and again, this woman must re-create the struggle with the dark forces that defeated her as a child, hoping to have more parity in the battle now that she is an adult. Angry from childhood and seeking to avenge herself in the present for the past, she is a fighter, a scrapper, a debater, a harridan. She needs to punish. She demands apologies, retribution. And finally, you may, alas, be the victim, the most powerless of the three, seeing no options but to be at the whim of others' behavior. Perhaps there seemed to be no options when you were a child other than being victimized, but now the role is so familiar that there is actually strength to be gained from it. There is a tyranny in weakness, its coin is guilt, and that is the currency of exchange in the victim's relationships. To play any of these positions, whether in a conversation or in life, keeps the focus off yourself and holds you in your childhood pattern of fear, rage, and helplessness. You cannot develop your potential as a fully evolved human being, an adult who is in charge of her life, if you do not give up each of these restrictive roles, these ways of being obsessed with the others around you. As long as you are caught up in these roles, these games, it will appear that another person is keeping you from your goal of happiness. Once you have let go of the games, you are left with total responsibility for your own behavior, your own choices, and your own life. In fact, when the games stop, your choices, both those you've already made and those that are now other options, become more obvious, less avoidable. What not getting hooked into the games implies. You now must develop new ways of communicating with yourself and others that demonstrate your willingness to take responsibility for your life. Less of if it weren't for, and lots more of right now I'm choosing to, you will need all the energy that was freed by letting go of managing and controlling when you begin to practice this step, to avoid falling into the games, even announcing I'm not playing is playing. It becomes much easier with practice, and after time becomes very self-reinforcing. You will need to learn to live without all the excitement of the heated battles, those time-consuming, energy-draining dramas in which you've been co-starring. This is not easy to do. Many women who love too much have buried their feelings so deeply that they need the excitement of fights, partings, and reconciliations to even feel alive. Beware! Having nothing but your own inner life on which to concentrate may be boring at first. But if you can hold still with the boredom, it will metamorphose into self-discovery. And you will be ready for the next step. 
7. Courageously face your own problems and shortcomings. What it means. Facing your own problems means that, having let go of managing and controlling others and of the games, you now are left with nothing to distract you from your own life, your own problems, and your own pain. This is the time when you need to begin to look at yourself deeply, with the help of your spiritual program, your support group, and your therapist if you have one. It is not always necessary to have a therapist for this process. In the anonymous programs, for instance, people who have experienced a degree of recovery may become sponsors to newcomers, and in that role will often help those they sponsor go through this process of self-examination. It also means that you look hard at your own life in the present, both at what you feel good about and what makes you uncomfortable or unhappy. Write it out in lists. Also look at the past. Examine all the good and bad memories, the accomplishments, the failures, the times you were hurt, and the times you did the hurting. Look at it all, again in writing. Focus on areas of particular difficulty. If sex is one of these areas, write out a complete personal sexual history. If men have always been a problem to you, start with your earliest relationships with men, and again, do a complete history. Parents? Use the same technique with them. Start at the beginning and write. Lots of writing, yes, but it is an invaluable tool to help you sort out your past and to begin to recognize the patterns, the repeating themes, in your struggles with yourself and others. When you begin this process, do as complete a job as you can before you stop. This is a technique you will want to use again later, when problem areas crop up. Perhaps at first you will concentrate on relationships. Later, at another time, you may want to write out your history of jobs, how you felt about each one before you started, during the period of your employment, and afterward. Just let your memories, thoughts, and feelings flow. Don't examine your writing for patterns as you go, do this afterward. What courageously facing your own problems and shortcomings requires. You will have to do a great deal of writing, making the commitment of time and energy necessary to accomplish it. Writing may not be an easy or comfortable means of expression for you. It is, however, the best technique for this exercise. Do not worry about doing it perfectly, or even well. Just do it in a way that makes sense to you. You will need to be as completely honest and self-revealing as possible in all that you write. Once you have completed this project as well as you can, share it with one other human being who cares about you and whom you trust. This person should be someone who understands what you are trying to do to recover and can simply listen to what you have written about your sexual history, your relationship history, your history with your parents, your feelings about yourself, and the events in your life, both good and bad. The person you choose as a listener should obviously have compassion and understanding. There is no need for comment at all and this should be understood from the beginning. No advice, no encouragement. Just listening. At this point in your recovery, do not make your partner the person who hears all this from you. Much, much later you may choose to share with him what you have written, or you may not. But it is not appropriate to share this with him now. You are letting someone hear it so that you can experience what it is like to tell your story, and be accepted. This is not a device for ironing out wrinkles in the relationship. Its purpose is self-discovery, period. Why courageously facing your own problems and shortcomings is necessary Most of us who love too much are caught up in blaming others for the unhappiness in our lives, while denying our own faults and our own choices. This is a cancerous approach to life that must be rooted out and eliminated, and the way to do so is to take a good, hard, honest look at ourselves. Only by seeing your problems and your faults, and your good points and successes, as yours, rather than related somehow to him, can you take the steps to change what needs to be changed? What courageously facing your own problems and shortcomings implies? First, you will very likely be able to let go of secret guilt connected with many of the events and feelings of the past. This will clear the way for allowing more joy and healthier attitudes to be manifest in your life. Then, because someone has heard your worst secrets and you haven't been destroyed by that fact, you will begin to feel safer in the world. When you let go of blaming others and take responsibility for your own choices, you become free to embrace all kinds of options that were not available to you when you saw yourself as a victim of others. This prepares you to begin to change those things in your life that are either not good for you, not satisfying, or unfulfilling. 8. Cultivate whatever needs to be developed in yourself. What it means. Cultivating whatever needs to be developed in yourself means not waiting for him to change before you get on with life. This also means not waiting for his support financially, emotionally, or in practical matters for you to start your career, or change your career, 
or go back to school, or whatever it is you want to do. Instead of making your plans dependent on his cooperation, make them as though you had no one but yourself on whom to lean. Cover all the contingencies, child care, money, time, transportation, without using him as a resource, or an excuse. If you're protesting as you read this that without his cooperation your plans are impossible, consider by yourself, or brainstorm with a friend, how you would do it if you didn't even know him. You'll find that it is very possible to make life work for you when you stop depending on him and instead make use of all your other options. Cultivating yourself means actively pursuing your interests. If you've been too busy for too long with him and you don't have a life of your own at all, then begin by pursuing lots of different avenues to find out what does appeal to you. This is not an easy thing for most women who love too much. Having made that man your project for so long, it feels uncomfortable to switch the focus to yourself and to explore what is good for your own growth. Be willing to try at least one brand new activity each week. Look at life as a smorgasbord, and help yourself to lots of different experiences so that you can discover what appeals to you. Cultivating yourself means taking risks, encountering new people, going into a classroom for the first time in years, taking a trip alone, looking for a job, whatever you know you need to do, but haven't been able to summon the courage for. This is the time to plunge ahead. There are no mistakes in life, only lessons, so get out there and let yourself learn some of what life wants to teach you. Use your support group as a source of encouragement and feedback. Do not turn to your relationship or to that dysfunctional family of origin for encouragement. They need for you to stay the same, so that they can stay the same. Don't sabotage yourself and your growth by leaning on them. What cultivating whatever needs developing in yourself requires to begin with, do two things each day that you don't want to do, in order to stretch yourself and expand your idea of who you are and what you are capable of doing. Stand up for yourself when you'd rather pretend it doesn't matter, or return an item that is unsatisfactory even if you'd rather just throw it away. Make that phone call you'd like to avoid. Learn how to take better care of yourself and less care of everyone else in your interactions. Say no to please yourself, rather than yes to please someone else. Ask clearly for something you want, and risk being refused. Then, learn to give to yourself. Give time, give attention, give material objects. Often making a commitment to buy yourself something every day can be a real lesson in self-love. The gifts can be inexpensive, but frankly the less practical and more frivolous, the better. This is an exercise in self-indulgence. We need to learn that we ourselves can be the source of good things in our lives, and this is a good way to begin. But if you have no problem spending money on yourself, if indeed you shop and spend compulsively to assuage your anger or your depression, then this lesson in giving to yourself needs to take a different direction. Treat yourself to new experiences rather than gathering up more material objects and more debts. Take a stroll in the park or a hike in the hills or a trip to the zoo. Stop and watch the sunset. The point is to think about yourself and what you'd like your present for the day to be, then to allow yourself to experience both the giving and the receiving. We are usually very good at giving to others, but very unpracticed at giving to ourselves. So practice. In taking these steps, you will be required to do something from time to time that is very difficult. You will have to face the terrible emptiness within that surfaces when you are not focused on someone else. Sometimes the emptiness will be so deep, you will almost be able to feel the wind blowing through the place where your heart should be. Allow yourself to feel it, in all its intensity, otherwise you'll look for another unhealthy way to distract yourself. Embrace the emptiness and know that you will not always feel this way, and that just by holding still and feeling it you will begin to fill it with the warmth of self-acceptance. Let your support group help you with this. Their acceptance can also help fill the void, as can your own projects and activities. We achieve a sense of self from what we do for ourselves and how we develop our own capacities. If all your efforts have gone into developing others, you're bound to feel empty. Take your turn now. Why cultivating whatever needs to be developed in you is necessary unless you maximize your own talents, you will always be frustrated. And that frustration may then be blamed on him, when it actually issues from your not getting on with your own life. Developing your potential takes the blame off him and puts the responsibility for your life squarely where it belongs with you. The projects and activities you choose to pursue will keep you too busy to be able to focus on what he is and isn't doing. If you are not currently in a relationship, this will give you a healthy, wholesome alternative to either pining for your last love or waiting for your next one. What cultivating whatever needs developing in yourself implies for one thing, you won't need to find a partner who is your opposite in order to bring balance into your life. 
To explain, like most women who love too much, you are probably overly serious and responsible. Unless you actively cultivate your playful side, you will be drawn to men who embody what you lack. A carefree, irresponsible man makes a charming acquaintance but is a poor prospect for a satisfying relationship. Nevertheless, until you can give yourself permission to be more free and easy, you'll need him to create the fun and excitement in your life. For another thing, cultivating yourself enables you to grow up. As you become all you are capable of being, you also take full responsibility for your decisions, your choices, your life, and in this way you embrace adulthood. Until we take responsibility for our own lives and our own happiness, we are not fully mature human beings, but rather remain dependent and frightened children in adult bodies. Finally, developing yourself makes you better partner material, because you are a fully expressive, creative woman, not someone who is incomplete, and therefore frightened, without a man. Ironically, the less you need a partner, the better partner you become and the healthier partner you will attract, and be attracted to. 9. Become selfish What it means like the word spirituality in step 4, selfish here requires careful explanation. It probably conjures up an image of exactly what you don't want to be, indifferent, cruel, thoughtless, self-centered. For some people, selfishness may mean all this, but remember, you are a woman with a history of loving too much. For you, becoming selfish is a necessary exercise in letting go of martyrdom. Let's look at what healthy selfishness means for women who love too much, you put your well-being, your desires, your work, play, plans, and activities first instead of last, before, instead of after, everyone else's needs are met. Even if you are the parent of small children you incorporate into your day some purely self-nurturing activities. You expect and even require that situations and relationships be comfortable for you. You do not try to adapt yourself to fit uncomfortable ones. You believe that your wants and needs are very important, and that meeting them is your job. At the same time, you grant others the right to be responsible for meeting their own wants and needs. What becoming selfish requires as you begin to put yourself first, you must learn to tolerate other people's anger and disapproval. These are inevitable reactions from those whose welfare you have heretofore put before your own. Do not argue, apologize, or attempt to justify yourself. Remain as even-tempered and cheerful as possible and go on about your activities. The changes you are making in your life require that those around you change, too, and they will naturally resist. But unless you give credence to their indignation, it will be fairly short-lived. It is just an attempt to push you back into your old, selfless behavior, into doing for them what they can and should do for themselves. You must listen carefully to your inner voice regarding what is good for you, right for you, and then follow it. This is how you develop healthy self-interest, by listening to your own cues. Up to now you've probably been nearly psychic at picking up other people's cues about how they wanted you to behave. Tune those cues out, or they'll continue to drown out your own. Becoming selfish finally requires that you recognize your worth is great, that your talents are worthy of expression, that your fulfillment is as important as anyone else's, and that your best self is the greatest gift you have to give the world as a whole, and most especially those closest to you. Why becoming selfish is necessary without this strong commitment to yourself, the tendency is to become passive, to develop yourself not for your own greatest expression but for someone else's benefit. Although becoming selfish, which also means becoming honest, will make you a better partner, that cannot be your ultimate goal. Your goal must be the achievement of your own highest self. Rising above all the difficulties you've encountered isn't enough. There is still your own life to be lived, your own potential to be explored. It is the natural next step as you gain respect for yourself and start honoring your wants and your wishes. Taking responsibility for yourself and your happiness gives a great freedom to children who have felt guilty and responsible for your unhappiness, which they always do. A child can never hope to balance the scales or repay the debt when a parent has sacrificed her life, her happiness, her fulfillment for the child or the family. Seeing a parent fully embrace life gives the child permission to do the same, just as seeing a parent suffer indicates to the child that suffering is what life is all about. What becoming selfish implies? Your relationships automatically become healthier. No one owes it to you to be other than they are, because you are no longer being other than you are for them. You free the others in your life to take care of themselves without worrying about you. It is very likely that your children, for instance, have been feeling responsible for easing your frustration and pain. As you do a better job of taking care of yourself, they are free to take better care of themselves. 
you now can say yes or no when you want to. As you make the dramatic shift in roles from caretaker of others to caretaker of yourself, it is very likely that your behavior will be balanced by shifts of roles throughout your relationships. If the role changes are too difficult for the man in your life, he may leave, searching for someone else who is the way you used to be so you may not end up with the person you began with. On the other hand, it's ironic that as you become better able to nurture yourself, you may find that you've attracted someone who is able to nurture you. As we become healthier and more balanced, we attract healthier and more balanced partners. As we become less needy, more of our needs are met. As we give up the role of super nurturer, we make space for someone to nurture us. 10. Share with others what you have experienced and learned. What it means. Sharing your experiences with others means remembering that this is the last step in recovery, not the first. Being too helpful and focusing on others is part of our disease, so wait until you've worked hard on your own recovery before you tackle this step. In your peer support group, it means sharing with newcomers what it used to be like and how it is now. This does not mean giving advice, only explaining what has worked for you. It also doesn't mean naming names or casting blame on others. By the time you are at this stage of recovery you know that blaming others is not helpful to you. Sharing with others also means that when you meet someone who is from a similar background, or in a situation similar to what yours was, you are willing to talk about your own recovery without needing to coerce that person into doing what you did to recover. There is no place for managing and controlling here any more than there was in your relationship. Sharing may mean giving some hours as a volunteer to help other women, perhaps by working on a hotline or meeting one-to-one -one with someone who has reached out for help. Finally, it may mean helping to educate the medical and counseling professions about the appropriate treatment approach for yourself and women like you. What sharing with others what you have experienced and learned requires you must tap your deep sense of gratitude for having come so far, and for the help others gave you along the way through their sharing. You need honesty and a willingness to let go of your secrets and your need to look good. Finally, you must reveal a capacity to give to others without a motive of personal gratification. Most of the giving we did when we were loving too much was actually manipulation. Now we are free enough to be able to give freely. Our own needs are met and we are full of love. The natural thing to do now is to share that love, without expecting anything in return. Why sharing what you have experienced and learned is necessary if you believe you have an illness, you also need to realize that like an alcoholic who is sober, you could slip. Without constant vigilance you could resume your old ways of thinking, feeling, and relating. Working with newcomers helps to keep you in touch with how sick you once were, and how very far you've come. It keeps you from denying how bad it really was, because a newcomer's story is going to be much like your own, and you will remember with compassion, for her and yourself, what it was like. By talking about it, you give hope to others, and validity to all you went through in your struggle to recover. You gain perspective on your courage and on your life. What sharing what you have experienced and learned implies you will help others recover. And you will maintain your own recovery. This sharing, then, is ultimately an act of healthy selfishness, by which you further promote your own well-being through staying in touch with the principles of recovery that will serve you all your life.